All right. Um, for those of you that are media, I am Becky Love, and I use they, them pronouns. I am a co-founder of the Florida Coalition for Trans Liberation. Um, we're very grateful uh, for everyone who is joining us. If you are media, please turn off your camera. Um, if you need permission to record, please let me know and I will um, give you permission to record. Just message me um, directly to the rest of you and please feel free to turn your cameras on if you're here in support um, of protecting trans and LGBTQ youth in the state of Florida. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, it is top, top of the hour, so we're gonna get started. Um, again, my name is Lakey Love, and I am, today I'm representing the Florida Coalition for Transgender Liberation and the Florida People's Advocacy Center. Um, we are here with a coalition of folks and the Senate Minority Leader, um, Gary Farmer, is here to join us um, to speak about the legislation that's happening in Florida's capital. Um, that is a targeted attack on the most vulnerable youth in the state of Florida. And that in particular is transgender and LGBTQI plus youth um, in the form of two separate bills. The first is SB 2012 HB 1475. This is the anti-trans youth athlete ban. And I will let our speakers um, tell you about uh, the bill and the problems that we have with it. Um, we are also here today to speak out against HB 241, SB 582, which is a violation of student rights, um, a long bill that uh, covers a, a lot of ground, um, but that essentially we are standing out on today um, for several reasons. And that is because of its attack and enforcing staff to come to, to reveal when youth come out to them as either um, on, on the basis of their sexual orientation or gender identity, um, forcing the staff in, in a school in a K through 12 setting to come out to parents and report um, on that, that student's um, sexual identity and, and gender identity status. So um, we have other issues with that bill as well, but those are our two my primary um, points for the Florida Coalition for Transgender Liberation. Um, I'd like to start out the day um, by welcoming Senator Farmer um, to, the, to the floor and let him, him discuss, discuss with you why he has decided to join us today. We are a large coalition um, and I will announce the various organizations that are standing with us against this hor horrible legislation here in a moment. But Senator Farmer, I'm gonna turn it over to you to get us, um, to get us started, if that's okay. Thank you for joining us. Um, it's very important to have that we have you here today, and we're so delighted um, that you decided to stand up uh, against these horrendous bills. Well, uh, thank you very much, Lakey. Uh, it's an honor to be here with you uh, and this coalition. And it's um, it's really sad that we have to even form a coalition to do a very simple thing, and that's protect uh, young people's right uh, to be normal. <laughs> to, 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 to seek normalcy and to, and to continue to do the things that, that uh, they've done all their life, um, which now they're being, uh, uh, seeing obstacles to doing simply because of a recognition uh, of a transgender issue. Um, this bill is, uh, I don't believe that the sponsors of this bill uh, are, are mean-spirited at all, but I think it's the result of uh, a lack of information and, and, and not really understanding uh, the issue uh, and many issues facing uh, transgender youth. Uh, first of all, this is really a bill, uh, a solution in search of a problem. Uh, we have uh, never, both the sponsors of this bill have uh, recognized publicly and agreed that uh, there has never been a complaint or incident in the state of Florida involving uh, a transgender uh, girl, and that's primarily where they, they speak to uh, uh, competing at any level. Um, 
and that includes zero complaints whatsoever related to any injuries or safety concerns or unfair advantage uh, from a transgender person competing in, in high school sports. Uh, and so uh, you gotta begin with that premise. Uh, this is not a problem in the state of Florida. Um, yet they continue to persist with this narrative and uh, they, they fail to recognize that um, even if, if the humanity part uh, of this discussion doesn't move them and uh, uh, the statistics are overwhelming, by the way, uh, the number of uh, transgender youth who end up homeless, uh, who end up kicked out of their home because uh, uh, of transgender issues uh, uh, or simply sexual orientation issues. Um, uh, the, the number of, of uh, young people who will decline medical care because of fear over uh, 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 you know, their, their sexual orientation or their transgender status being uh, revealed to people they don't want it revealed to or because of unknown consequences of seeking that medical care. Uh, you could go on and on uh, as to the other hurdles uh, that transgender youth face uh, in this country and in the state of Florida. Uh, and as I said, you know, they're, they're just seeking uh, to live their life in a way that, that they feel comfortable and, and, and that they believe is best for them and, and seeking that sense of normalcy. And so uh, for us, we should be, I think, uh, doing what we can to promote their ability to do so and, and provide counseling and, and, and understanding, uh, not provide a ban uh, to engaging in sports, which is, as I said, uh, already hard enough, uh, hard for them to train and do other things publicly because of transgender status. Uh, and so um, just, just uh, as I said, a truly a, a solution in search of a problem. Uh, but if you're not moved by that, that humane aspect and, and argument uh, on this matter, uh, the economics uh, should 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 compel uh, a rejection of this bill. Um, we we already know that uh, this bill is, if it were to pass, it will be challenged in the courts as it's being challenged in Idaho, where it's already passed. It's going to cost our state millions of dollars uh, to uh, defend uh, an ill-conceived and uh, uh, I I believe uh, um, uh, harmful piece of legislation. Uh, moreover, uh, um, the uh, NCAA uh, has uh, announced that uh, they, uh, after a petition uh, signed by, by hundreds of transgender athletes and coaches and, and others within the athletic sphere, uh, the NCAA has announced that they will not allow states who pass a bill like this uh, to host uh, NCAA competitions. Uh, that could lead to millions and millions of dollars in lost revenue for the state of Florida at a time where we're suffering from the uh, uh, effects of the coronavirus on, on our economy and our, our budget uh, as such a shortfall projected this year and going into next year. Uh, so we shouldn't be doing anything that is going to uh, cause more economic harm to the state of Florida. Uh, 55 major corporations uh, have signed the national business statement opposing anti-LGBTQ state legislation. And these are not little companies. We're talking about companies like Facebook, uh, uh, Pfizer, Peloton, Dell, Amazon, Apple, AT&T, uh, Hilton, Google, uh, the list goes on and on and on. Companies like that are not gonna see fit to expand their business operations in the state of Florida if we were uh, to pass this bill. And so there are very, very compelling uh, economic reasons uh, to oppose this bill, uh, but that's, that's not what brings me here today. Uh, what brings me here today uh, is the thought of, of one of my daughters uh, recognizing one day uh, that, that she was uh, a, a transgender person and, and wanted to switch genders and the harm that could come to her and the lack of understanding and the lack of support and the lack of compassion that exists on that issue, that, that is not an easy uh, decision to make uh, for any young person, uh, but they make it because they are following uh, their heart uh, and their mind and, and what they feel in their soul. And as I said, we as, as Floridians as, and as legislators should be doing everything we can to support young people who make that decision. And to pass this piece of legislation would just be harmful in so many ways. As I said at the outset, 
uh, young people who who make this life altering and 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 gut wrenching decision, in many instances, uh, they they are looking for normalcy. They want to continue to do the things they love. And if they've been an athlete before they've decided to make a, a transgender decision, they should be allowed to remain an athlete. And as I said, there has been no indication whatsoever of any kind of competitive in, uh, disadvantage for those competing against transgender athletes. There have been no indication whatsoever as to any safety concerns uh, with transgender athletes uh, competing in sports. And so there is absolutely really no compelling reason uh, to pass or to promote this legislation. And so uh, I believe I speak uh, on behalf of my entire Democratic caucus in that uh, we will seek to oppose this legislation. And we hope that uh, uh, our colleagues in the Senate and the House and, and the sponsors of this legislation uh, realize uh, uh, some of the many uh, unintended consequences and, and that we can stop this legislation from passing so that these young people uh, can go on with their lives and, and receive support uh, not not ridicule or or banned from something that they love doing. Thank you, Senator Farmer. Again, um, wow, that was strange. I'm getting some kind of feedback. Um, thank you again, Senator Farmer. So so grateful to have you here. Um, I'm going to put Kara Gross um, on the spot as our next speaker. Um, Kara is uh, the political director at the ACLU of Florida um, and can speak to the legal ramifications of both of these bills um, and the ACLU of Florida's objection um, to the legislation. Thank you, Lakey. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm Kara Gross, the legislative director and senior policy counsel for the ACLU of Florida. And the ACLU of Florida opposes any and all anti-LGBTQ legislation. By imposing bans on girls and young women who are transgender from participating in athletics consistent with their gender mm -hmm. identity, SB 2012 and HB 1475 discriminate based on transgender status and sex in violation of the United States Constitution and Title IX of the Civil Rights Act. A similar anti-trans youth sports ban bill that was passed in Idaho last year has since been enjoined in the courts in the case of Hecox v. Little. Every court to consider this issue since the Supreme Court's decision in Bostock has held that where a policy treats transgender, transgender students who are transgender differently and worse than students who are not, it violates both Title IX and the Equal Protection Clause. SB 2012 and HB 1475 are similarly unconstitutional. This bill is a solution in search of a problem. There is no evidence that there's any widespread problem in our state concerning transgender girls participating in sports. Moreover, advocates for women and girls sports, such as the National Women's Law Center, the Women's Sports Foundation, and women's leaders in college sports support trans inclusive policies and oppose efforts to exclude transgender students from participating in sports. This bill, if passed, would entirely eliminate the ability of girls and women who are transgender to participate in athletics. It excludes transgender girls in elementary school, in middle school, in high school and beyond from playing sports with their peers. When transgender classmates are welcomed into school sports, students are taught acceptance and inclusivity rather than discrimination and hate. SB 2012 sends a message to transgender young people that they do not belong in their schools and that they do not belong in their communities. And transgender students need to be affirmed and supported, not discriminated against, ostracized, and excluded. Moreover, this bill risks costing the state millions of dollars in litigation costs and fees, as well as potentially the loss of hundreds of millions of federal dollars, which will be put at risk if the state knowingly passes a bill that violates Title IX, and this state is on notice. Additionally, we oppose bills like SB 582 and HB 241, which seek to inject a viewpoint into our schools that is offended by the very existence of LGBTQ individuals and seeks to erase their presence from history and from literature and from the culture at large. These bills are harmful to our youth and we call upon our state legislators to reject hate and oppose these bills. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Kara. We really appreciate your support and, and the support of ACLU of Florida. 
Um, I'm loving that you just put the state on notice. So um, grateful for that. And um, we are going to grab that and, and hashtag it. I think you are now on notice. <laughs> the ACLU is coming after you if you pass this legislation. Um, next, I would like to um, bring to the microphone Lauren Brinzel. Um, Lauren is a tireless advocate for the Florida Alliance of Planned Parenthood Affiliates an outspoken leader on things like reproductive justice, trans rights and justice, as well as sex education and the importance and of Black Lives Matter and intersectionality in the movement that we all stand for. Um, can Lauren, if you can come off mute and um, tell us a little bit more about why Planned Parenthood objects to these two bills and maybe specifically focus a little bit on the sex education and HIV issues in the parents' rights bill for us. Thanks. Awesome, thank you, Lakey. Um, so my name is Lauren Brenzel and I'm speaking today on behalf of the Florida Alliance of Planned Parenthood Affiliates. In the Florida legislature, Planned Parenthood is unfortunately very accustomed to seeing attacks on health care and attempts to strip bodily autonomy in favor of political clout. What's becoming more clear, however, is that the Florida legislature has a new persona non grata, someone whom legislators have regularly made the target of legislation and debate. Who is shouldering this hate? Who is dealing with this ostracization by politicians who are supposed to represent them? children, teens, and young people, and more specifically, trans children, teens, and young people. Bills like SB 2012 and SB 241 are politically motivated attacks masquerading as family values that scapegoat young people to appeal to hateful extremists. One thing is for certain, no one needs to make access to healthcare more difficult for trans people. There is no good reason to ban trans people for playing sports, and certainly no one needs to out LGBTQ young people to their parents. None of these hateful ideas are good policy. They won't better health outcomes or keep kids safer or promote social support. Instead, these policies will do the opposite, further marginalizing trans students from their peers, outing queer and trans kids to their parents, who may put them in danger, and worsening physical and mental health outcomes. Those most marginalized by these policies will be those who are already the most vulnerable within the trans community, namely black and brown young women. But that doesn't seem to be of concern to legislators supporting and voting for these bills. Why? Because these bills are effective political fodder, fodder for a base that demonizes queer and trans people. Because these bills are a monumental distraction for leadership that has left Florida with a crumbling infrastructure for public health outcomes and a failing unemployment system because targeting hate is an effective rallying call, and because for some legislators, that is more important than the damage and wreckage these bills will cause in young LGBTQ people's lives. For those of us in the LGBTQ community, we know what it means to be forced to overcome others' hatred. We know what it means to be a young person who is left with a choice that often feels impossible. Stifle yourself and deal with it, or live your truth and open yourself up to potential ridicule and danger. We as advocates within the LGBTQ community work hard every day to better outcomes for young people so that their experience can be more than ours and so that they can live in a society that loves, supports, and affirms them. Unfortunately, legislators like Kaylee Tuck, Kelly Stargell, Ray Rodriguez, Aaron Grawl, and any legislator who supports anti-trans legislation are working to do the opposite. Today, we in this coalition and the Florida Alliance of Planned Parenthood Affiliates stand in stark opposition to this political agenda of hatred. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lauren. Really appreciate that. And, and so glad to have you all here. And we have a, a number of groups that are standing with us. And I am I'm, I'm hearing that there's some kind of problem with the live feed on the event. And I apologize for that, even though my screen is showing that we are live on the event. Um, and I just want to acknowledge those groups that are standing with us, but that are not speaking here today. Um, the first is um, the, the Florida National Organization for Women, who also taught fought tirely, tirelessly against these bills um, or versions of bills like these last year. Um, we're so grateful that you all are standing with us. Also, um, local organizations, the Jacksonville Transgender Action Committee, the UNF Students for Democratic Society, Strive in Pensacola, um, and the Workers' World Party Central Gulf Coast. 
Um, our next speaker is directly impacted and will be speaking represent, representing the Miami-Dade area and the Rainbow Rights PAC. Rosen, um, can you please come off, open your mic and, and share with us? Hello, y'all. So before I start, I want to give a quick content notice because I'm going to be discussing some content that could be triggering. So it will involve discussions of outing, homelessness, misgendering, and abuse of parents, and I'll be reclaiming the Q slur as well. So as y'all know, my name is Rosen T. Gordon, and my pronouns are Z, Zer, and Zers. I'm currently 21 years old, and I'm a junior at Florida International University in, in Miami, Florida, also known, my university is also known as FIU. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, I was the captain of my intramural flag football team, which is composed of various genders at FIU. So prior to university, I grew up in Palm Bay, Florida, and I attended K-12 through schools in Brevard Public Schools. I had attended high school at West Virginia Senior High School in Melbourne, Florida. In spring 2018, my senior year of high school, I ran track in the boys' division. I had to go through the long, bureaucratic, gatekeeping process that the Florida High School Athletic Association, FHSS, FHSAA, requires for trans student athletes who will compete in division different from our gender center birth. So my case was approved and I got to run in a division that was the closest to affirming my gender. No student, athletes, coaches, or families ever had a problem with me running against guys, including cisgender guys. And cisgender means not transgender. So I know legislation like HB 1475 and SB 2012, like the anti-transgender youth at the bill, will specifically harm trans girls and non-binary kids who are assigned male at birth. Trans girls and non-binary kids who were assigned male at birth deserve to be able to enjoy sports and divisions that affirm their, their genders or a gender or being a gender, just like I was able to. In fact, the Florida High School Athletic Association already permits trans student athletes to participate in single gender sports single gender sports in division that form their gender or them being a gender. Unfortunately, um, even though my track coaches and track, my fellow track students knew I was trans, considering I was running in the boys division, um, they always misgendered me, never apologizing, never correcting themselves. Back then, I did not correct people. I thought there was no point because I feared they would never try to correctly use my pronouns. Um, I thought they would never try to correctly refer to my gender that they would harass me even more and or they would out me to my parents. So the West Shore Athletic Director did indeed email my parents about me running in the boys track for a div track division, which they did without my consent. I, and I was very scared my parents would read the email and kick me out of the house. Thankfully, they never saw the email. However, when my mom later found out about me being queer the summer after my senior year of high school, she gave me a curfew and threatened to take away my car. Our relationship was very strained, strained after then, the one time I visited my parents since coming to university, I had the most anxiety I'd felt since graduating high school. I cut off, I eventually cut off all communication with my parents by my senior, sorry, by my sophomore year at FIU. If I had been outed while in high school, I do not know if I would have been able to manage losing my parents and becoming independent so soon. I did not have the support system, legal rights, or access to resources in high school that, that I do now at university. Specifically in regards to HB 241 and SB 582, the so-called parents' rights bills, outing West LGBTQIA plus and same gender loving SGL students to their guardians is dangerous. I know to West LGBTQIA plus and SGL people who were kicked out of their homes as kids by their guardians and my friends struggle to survive. To West LGBTQIA plus and SGL homelessness is a rampant problem. According to the 2017 study, Missed Opportunities, Youth Homelessness in America, conducted by Chapin Hall at the University of Chicago, Black youth have an 83% higher risk of homelessness than non-Black youth. The aforementioned study found that West LGBTQIA plus and SGL youth are 120% more likely to be homeless than heteromantic, heterosexual, cisgender, and dyadic youth, which dyadic means not intersex. Now, I imagine, now imagine my risk as a black gay trans kid. Some guardians will create a toxic home home life, making it hard for students to have a positive well-being and focus on school. That is what my parents did. To us, LGBTQIA plus and SGL students deserve autonomy. We should be able to come out on our own terms when we're ready, if ever. A, I'm very out and proud as a non-binary trans man. I correct people when they misgender me and I surround myself with people who are from who I am. 
able to do so because the LGBTQA initiatives office at FIU, Floating House University, has fostered an environment where I feel safe and brave to be who I am and assert who I am. I hope K through 12 schools in Florida will do the same for students. Thank you. Wow. Um, thank you for that, Roseanne, and for um, your candid um, your candid story here with us. That takes a lot of uh, courage, and um, we are honored that you would would share that story with us today. Um, bless you and all that you do and all that you are, um, and thank you for standing up to protect kids that are coming behind you. And also are at USF, right? Because the trans youth athlete band covers colleges. So um, next I would like to bring, <laughs> this is really putting him on the spot because he just joined us, but um, Reverend Andy Oliver is here today um, representing, the, the, representing the Florida Council of Trustees and his own, um, his own church in St. Petersburg, Florida. So I'm gonna let him tell a little bit more about himself. Thank you for being here, Reverend Oliver, and him to speak to the moral and ethical claims against this legislation. Thank you, uh, Lakey, so much for organizing this. My name is Andy Oliver. I'm pastor at Allendale United Methodist Church in St. Petersburg. My pronouns are he, him, his. Um, you know, the church has has been used to do so much harm uh, to the LGBT community, but especially to those who identify as trans um, or or non-binary. Um, this is uh, legislation that seeks to codify this harm that we have to stop. And so, as a pastor, um, you know. Part of my job is to to be in solidarity with those who are marginalized and oppressed. Um, and um, I have um, found that the most important work that I can do is to be present with with uh, the transgender community, especially um, children who uh, may not have a safe home environment, may not have a safe space at school. And certainly this legislation seeks to undermine it. Um, this, this legislation is a, a, a coordinated bullying effort that's being pushed in over 23 states. Um, I, I, I share this story as a change of heart story. Um, the conservative Utah governor, uh, Spencer Cox, he decided he actually wouldn't sign a version of this bill uh, in his state into law. He said, quote, these kids are just trying to stay alive. He said, when you spend time with these kids, it changes your heart in important ways. Um, and so when, when I saw this bill come up on the docket, um, not only uh, has my church organized around this to prevent this from happening, uh, but my kids who are eight and 11, um, you know, saw the harm in this bill. And they said, daddy, we wanna give up two days of our spring break and we wanna go to Tallahassee and speak. And so Liam and Evan um, uh, got in the car, uh, gave up a, a trip to the beach, and we, we drove through the night to get to Tallahassee. And uh, my, my eight-year-old simply said, trans kids have um, enough problems to deal with. They don't, they don't need this working against them as well. Um, they need the ability to be able to play um, whatever sport they want um, and uh, to be able to compete um, with their friends. And my 11 year old had just gotten done watching the Netflix documentary, mm -hmm. Amend, uh, that Will Smith hosted. And he said, this bill uh, is unconstitutional because of the 14th Amendment. Um, if an eight and 11 year old can see that, um, I know that I know our legislators can too. Um, I know that this is just some, some red meat to throw to their base. It's sickening. It's sickening that they will use um, those who are marginalized and oppressed to, to score political points, but but that's what what is happening. Um, to anyone who um, is 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 trans on this call listening, um, I just want to say as a as a pastor, um, I love you. Um, God loves you. God created you just the way you are, um, perfect. Um, and um, if if anyone ever needs um, a listening ear, 
or someone to, to be in solidarity with it, someone to fight with them, someone to stand with them, someone to um, be a crying shoulder. Um, I am here and there's a whole community of, of people of faith that are here um, that, that have your back and always will. Again, thank you, Lakey, for organizing this. Um, we've got we to stand up together um, so that harmful legislation like this doesn't get through. Thank you. Bless you. Um, and bless Reverend Russell Meyer. He's also on the call um, and jumped jump to the floor when, when asked. Um, we really appreciate the faith community standing with us here. Um, and I can attest to Reverend Oliver's um, compassion if you, if you need uh, a shoulder. Um, he also gives great hugs. <laughs> um, for you all, give them a big round of applause. We, we need that. Um, especially in these trying times. Our last speaker um, is Kent Moreno. Um, Kent is representing QF Phoenix today. Um, and is going to wrap it up for us and, and, and take us out. And then I'll tell everyone a few minor ways that they can, uh, I mean, three ways that they can get involved to help stop this legislation. We, we can't hear Kent. We can't hear you. Can you hear me now? All right. So my name is Kent Marrero, like Lakey said. Um, I use they, them pronouns. I'm with Q Latinx, which is a post-pulse organization um, that emerged right after to fill that gap between the queer community and our racial intersections. Um, so this these bills for me are very personal. Um, content trigger warning just regarding religion, outing, that kind of thing. Um, I grew up with in private schools where religion was the guiding factor of my education. And if somebody had outed me prior to my being ready, I might not be here today. So um, from a racial intersection, if I had not had this education that I had um, outside of the curriculum that was established, I might not know as much as I know about my racial heritage. And a lot of that I've had to seek outside of the education system. So as a person who is Latinx and as a person who is non-binary and trans identified, uh, I know from personal experience how difficult navigating the world is when you don't have a diverse education and when you don't have access to adults that you can reach out to and talk to. Um, so going on, these two bills, the athletic ban and the so-called parents bill of rights are both model legislation. Like people have said, basically they're popping up everywhere. They're copy and paste and they're being fast tracked. Whether it's ignorance that's intentional or unintentional, it passed both of these bills would legalize discrimination, like our ACLU counterparts have said. It would legalize discrimination against LGBTQ kids, but also minority students, because the Parent Bill of Rights doesn't just attack uh, the ability to teach LGBTQ education, but also opens up the door to have somebody say that racial education uh, offends their beliefs and give them an in to basically start picking and choosing what is acceptable for uh, a child's education. And it hurts the diversity of their education. It hurts Florida taxpayers, like Senator Farmer said, and respectfully from what my notes have is that this could be more than millions to Florida taxpayers, but go into the billions um, because the North Carolina uh, bathroom bills were estimated to cost potentially over 10 years, $3.76 billion. And in Texas, that billion didn't go away. In Texas, it would have been 8.5 billion and risking 185,000 jobs. So if the personal doesn't affect the political stance that people have on this or that senators have on this or representatives have on this, then financially we are undergoing the most taxing 
pandemic we will probably see in our li lifetimes and we do not need that financial burden put onto taxpayers when Floridians are already struggling. Not to mention like Lakey and others have said that this model legislation is backed by groups which have been deemed hate groups by the Southern Poverty Law Center. So if our representatives in legislation didn't know before who was backing these bills that they're pushing forward, you know now and you're on notice that if you continue pushing these bills forward, you are pushing forward hate legislation which legalized discrimination and you are willing to cost the taxpayers of Florida billions of dollars to stand a moral high ground that is not backed by science. Now, when we add up all the facts regarding these bills, it's just bad legislation. And I have the luxury of being surrounded by teachers and their perspectives are invaluable. One of my board members is also a teacher um, in Q Latinx and something he said really stuck out. And that is that some kids have only one place where they can be their true selves and that's school. And if we take that away from them, we take away their one avenue to actually exist. And the pandemic has already done that for them, pushing them to remote learning, pushing them out of the schools to their GSAs. When I started trying to even organize for this press conference and for, for just fighting these bills, there are so many organizations that are inactive right now that are trans and LGBTQ affirming, right? into their homes that aren't always safe, where they have to pretend to be somebody they're not. And then we're going to pass legislation which legalizes discrimination at the, against them before they even reach the age of 18. It's absurd. Um, so yeah, as far as this goes, it also attacks a teacher's ability to productively educate their students. There's already avenues for parents to discuss the educational course their students are going through. This is like repeated people have said, a solution seeking a problem that will create additional problems and labor for already overtaxed, overworked, overburdened teachers. We can't afford these bills, whether it's banning kids from participating in sports where they feel like they can actually escape this world that politicizes their existence when they're just trying to live, or whether it's a bill that makes it so they have to think twice, more than twice, before getting tested for HIV, before talking to a, a teacher about the struggle that they're feeling between keeping up with their academics and having to hide at home, whether it's talking to a guidance counselor about being afraid of their parents finding out and whether or not they should apply to certain schools because it might indicate their LGBT status. These bills are dangerous and I don't say that lightly. And I say that as somebody who survived, but if I had been outed, I might not have. The difference between my 32 year old self and the 11 year old self who tried to kill themselves is that I didn't have a choice to separate myself from my blood relatives or my toxic surroundings. I do as an adult, minors don't. This is reckless endangerment and we need to kill these bills. It's too high of a price financially and our kids. We can't have a future if they don't make it to 18. So please understand that advocates are willing to talk to state legislators to meet them where they at, are at, at their educational journeys for these issues. But what we will not tolerate, we will not condone, we will not accept, and we will not allow to happen is that ignorance crafting state law. So like the ACLU said, if the legislators did not know prior to this press conference how bad these bills were, how toxic they are, how much they will cost taxpayers during a pandemic, you know now, you are on notice. We need to kill these bills. Awesome. Thank you so much for that wrap up, Kent. Um, and uh, to all of our speakers, um, 
I'm going to push back the, um, the what you can do next um, in an effort to honor Senator Farmer and everybody's time. And um, Senator Farmer needs to hop off here at 11.45. So we are going to open the floor for questions from the press. Um, if you are press and you have a question to one of our speakers, please go ahead and ask where you can message in the chat box. Not seeing any questions. Am I missing anyone? Okay. Um, I'm seeing the name Michael, but I'm not sure what press outlet you're from, Michael. Are you press? Okay. Um, okay. Oh, hi, Mike. <laughs> um, from the Florida Phoenix. Um, questions to the entire panel, I guess, is are you finding legislators open to persuasion? Meaning, are do we have any probably GOP legislators that are um, that are changing sides and, and coming around? Well, so far. Um... I guess kind of sadly, I'll say uh, no, not yet. Um, but this bill is really just starting to get some attention. And I think that um, overcoming uh, a very high level of ignorance is is really our, our main task here. Uh, the, the statistics are so compelling. Uh, and, we, and I spoke mostly about the uh, transgender youth uh, ban, but the... Um, the other uh, uh, bill requiring teachers and guidance counselors to make confidential information available uh, is, is equally uh, as harmful. And uh, I just want to say uh, thank you to, to Kent and to, to Rosen for, for sharing, um, you know, deeply personal uh, aspects of this, this discussion with us. Um, it, 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 I, I, you know, God, God loves all people. <laughs> That that's what I was taught uh, when when I was growing up and when I was an altar boy that that God loves us all and and this bill just doesn't provide that love to students who are most in need of uh, protection and support and not um, uh, outing and 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 ridicule and shaming and uh, I'm hopeful that uh, as more legislators have this conversation and then. And I would encourage all of you very, very much to please um, continue your outreach. Uh, um, we have thousands of bills that get filed up here every year. Um, uh, unfortunately, the reality is uh, we often don't pay attention to legislation until it's right there in front of us. Uh, and so, um, you know, but th this, this bill could be happening and there could be a lot of legislators that are just entirely unaware of it. Uh, and I can guarantee you they are entirely uh, unaware of, of the real life personal harm that, that these bills would bring uh, to transgender youth who are already struggling uh, uh, with a change that society is still coming to grips with. And so I would, I would strongly urge all of you to continue your advocacy. I, I'm so happy and, and not surprised at all though, but happy to see friends like Kara from ACLU and Karen from Florida PAC and, and so many people and, and, and Reverend Oliver. Um, uh, I sure hope one day I get to meet Liam and Evan uh, because you seem to have done a great job raising those young boys uh, and they uh, are spot on uh, with their commentary and their, uh, uh, their observations with regard to this bill and their, their uh, uh, participation is something that I hope uh, uh, more and more people will do. Uh, we've just got to keep the calls and letters and emails going and, and just let let my my fellow legislators know how harmful this legislation could be. Uh, it's not benign at all. It, it, it could actually harm so many, so many youth. Uh, and and, you know, as I said, and as Kent outlined, and if you're not moved by that, 
uh, we are typically moved by the money up here and, uh, and, the, and the millions, or as Ken said, billions of dollars that could, uh, Florida could lose over this misguided policy. Uh, if their conscience doesn't get them, maybe the pocketbook will. So um, I, I do have another call that I have to get on another uh, Zoom event. And so I apologize for leaving early, but Lakey, thank you for, for, for uh, uh, taking the lead on this. And thank you to all the, the people and groups who are here uh, in support. Uh, know that your Florida uh, Senate Democratic Caucus uh, is with you and we understand and, and we want to uh, protect you and we will do everything we can to stop these bills. So thank you all very much. Fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us, Senator Farmer. My pleasure. Um, uh, and I, you know, I can, um, I, I, I just want to make a, a quick comment and answer to um, Michael's question as well. Um, just commending those that have fought hard in debate um, and debate and, and asked really great questions. And uh, Representative Allison Tant um, went to bat during the parents' rights bill to ask a lot of questions. Um, my own representative, Ramon Alexander, um, spoke up pretty loud on, on these issues. Um, we've seen uh, Representative Jones make a lot of noise here, um, Senator Polsky. So we've seen some, we, you know, we've seen some people really speak out um, and show up. Of course, Representative Amy Mercado has a trans child, is very outspoken on these issues, um, as is uh, Rep. Escamani, um, Carlos Guerra Smith, um, and others. So we just really want to um, thank our friends. We also um, want to make mention that um, unfortunately we can't take for granted that all of the Democrats are with us. And so we um, ask people to, to hold their representatives accountable. If you live in an area um, where you rather your representative is a Republican or Democrat, and contact them on these bills and, and, and hold them accountable. And um, are there any other questions quickly? And then we'll just wrap up with two minutes of what people can do next to help support um, the pushback. Any other questions from the media? All right. Um, Strive in Pensacola, which is the longest local um, LGBTQ and trans run organization in, in Northwest Florida. Um, Literally, all of the panhandle strive has been there the longest and is the most outspoken, is running an, an educational rally event and that they are developing coalition support across the state for this weekend on April 4th. Um, UNF, Students for Democratic Society, will also be hosting a rally and education um, speak out on Sunday. Um, and we are hoping that there will be other organizations across the state states that will will be doing that tomorrow and sb 2012 is in senate health policy bright and early eight o'clock a.m it does look like it's the first um agenda item but there is an action alert that targets the health policy so you can email and um, your health policy committee and we'll put that up on the florida coalition for transgender liberations uh, facebook page um since if you see it in an email or if you sent an email before, send another one because it's targeting another committee. <laughs> and so keep sending the emails, call and um, call your own legislator, call the chair um, of the health policy committee, let them know, call um, Senator Farber, thank him for standing with us. Um, and remind them that this is not only costly um, to LGBTQ, trans, and minority youth, but will end up being costly to the state because we have the ACLU and the Southern Poverty Law Center here both um, saying that we're gonna um, we're 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 gonna hold you to it, um, but we will not be silenced. The community, the directly impacted community, will not be silenced, um, and neither will the 55 different corporations that um, have have spoken up and signed on to a letter that they will boycott bringing their businesses to the state that passed pro uh, pro 
hate legislation like this. So um, that includes Amazon and others. So we're talking big industry corporations and Florida will fail. We will not be open for business. <laughs> and Governor DeSantis, if you sign this into the law and, uh, <laughs> and we should say the same for, um, for, the, for the Senate president um, as well as the Speaker of the House. Um, this is not going to do anybody in Florida any good. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, it does appear that we may have had some live feed problems in the event, so we will make sure that the recorded version goes out to everyone on YouTube and is up on all of our sites. Um, if you are pressed, please, and you haven't announced yourself or given your contact information, please do so now so we can continue the recording um, and bless all of our speakers. For, for showing up, I am going to stop recording and stop the live stream.